Now imagine you're biking through the Netherlands and it looks like so a nice natural scenery and then all of a sudden the most dystopian urban building shows up <laughs> so these are uh, residential housing for the poor and actually this building you can't see it very well from here but it goes on in this direction for about half a kilometer it's behind those bushes they continue this type of building with almost no space in between it's just so in case you're thinking of coming to the Netherlands and you wonder what kind of a place you're going to end up living in well this is it this is where they stack the slaves and their migrants so here in front of me you can see a golf course that I stumbled upon and if you think about it for a moment why they put a fence right there to create a division between this highly maintained artificial reality that is completely unnatural so you can play golf there and then on the other side of the fence you have this somewhat more natural forest I wouldn't say wild but rather bewildered because these forests in the Netherlands have all been planted by humans by now there's no such thing as a wild forest in the Netherlands anymore there's a forester who manages this place, who decides when this tree in front of you is going to be cut down, how long it's allowed to be there or stand there. And here you see some, you see some trees that have fallen down and the forester decides that this is good for biodiversity, so he lets it rot. But it's all artificial, even though it looks really wild to our eyes and we recognize this as wilderness. It is not. It is not wilderness. It's designed wilderness the way a bureaucrat from behind his desk actually designed uh, how many trees to keep, how many to cut down, what type of trees, what type of birds they want, what kind of small animals and rodents they want to have here, uh, what kind of weeds they allow to grow here, and so on and so forth. It's completely artificial. So, talking about Talking about golf courses, when I was a teenager, I was working at a theme park in the Netherlands called the Efteling. And my job was in the IT department to help fix computers and printers and so on. And one day I got a call from the, uh, from the nearby golf club. And this was a very expensive golf club where you meet very rich people. Um, you have to pay at least 25,000 euros to become a member. So I went there with a colleague who had a car and we drove over to go and fix the receptionist's printer driver. Uh, I was 17 years old at the time and the moment we arrived there we noticed uh, some particular inequality. Uh, we were driving an old Fiat Panda, a small car. And as we were driving along this small road toward the clubhouse of the Efteling golf course, um, a big BMW or a Mercedes approached us and they were driving in the middle of the road and there was literally no way for us to get past that car other than to literally drive off the dike and uh, into the wilderness. And the other person, the rich person in their car, uh, simply refused to budge. Uh, if they had gone to the side, left or right, we could have passed. So my colleague did the only thing a poor people could do. We drove into the, into the lawn next to the road so that the BMW could pass us right in the middle of the road. And this is an attitude of rich people, is they don't give a fuck. And that is actually one of the reasons why they became rich people in the first place. So as I went there to fix the printer driver, as we're there talking to this nice girl she was 18 or 19 just a few years older than i was she was very pretty because of course the receptionists at these golf clubs they're all very pretty so we're in this luxury interior and i'm watching outside um, watching the lawn or the meadow just uh, outside of the windows of the lobby and a helicopter lands there a helicopter with a german baron who had just flown over for nothing other than to have lunch so just for lunch, some rich fellow from Germany, actual nobility, a baron,
comes over for lunch. He does this once a week. He doesn't care about golfing. He doesn't care about the golf club. He just likes the surroundings there. It was very pretty. And he lands his helicopter. He has a pilot, obviously. He doesn't pilot it himself. And he gets off and all he does is lunch. And then he flies back to Germany. I didn't feel oppressed by any of this, by the way. I felt mesmerized by it, that there can be such people with such attitudes to life who don't give a fuck, who do whatever they want. <laughs> they have lunch in their helicopters. They go for lunch in a helicopter and, well, what do they care, right? I started thinking about this. What makes rich people rich? What is it about the upper classes? They're just lucky, right? They won the lottery. Well, that's how some people get rich, but other people get rich because their families have been rich for a very long time. And that means there has to be some kind of behavior. How is it possible, for example, that the Italian Massimo family, who claim to be descendants of some Roman general who fought Hannibal, how come they are still rich and powerful? That's behavior. That's not just class, or you're born into this class and you stay rich. No, 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 it doesn't work like that because there's always peasants around you who want to kill you and take your money and take your wealth away. There's something about them that is in their way of life, in their attitude towards people. And I think I've discovered it. The people who get rich and stay rich are the very people who don't need anything. They don't need anything. They don't need anybody. What they do is they keep their needs at a very minimum and they enlarge their dreams and their wants. So they maximize what they want, but they minimize what they need. And that gives them the foundation for a certain social attitude where you literally don't give a fuck about anything. You can even risk death to get what you want. But because most other people cling on to life, that precious life, they're so insecure, they wouldn't dare to risk even a scratch on their arm. They would be afraid of being slapped in the face. And they will, they will like that big fat car on that small road toward the clubhouse, they will always win that fight. If you're playing a game of chicken between a rich person and a poor person, the poor person is gonna lose. Why? Because the poor person is needier. They need life. They need wealth. They need appreciation. They need love. They need a place to live. They need a place to travel. They need excitement. They need sex. <laughs> but the rich people who have all these things don't need those things. Turns out that wealth flows from the needy to those in want of it, from the needy to those who don't need. So let me explain to you a little bit more about how that works exactly. Uh, I call it string theory. It's got something to do with people pulling your strings, hence string theory. It's got nothing to do with physics, it's the social physics that I'm talking about. Say you're a man and you're deeply in need of a woman's love. What is it really that you need from her? Validation? Status? You want to have a beautiful girlfriend to go to a restaurant so people can see that you're the guy with the beautiful girlfriend? If you are very needy of these things, if you need to have a beautiful woman, she will have power over you. Because if you are more needy, yeah, if you are the needy person, and the person who doesn't need you as much as you need them, you've made yourself subordinate. You've made yourself subordinate to the other, and the other person will have power over you. And this is exactly what rich and powerful people do all the time. They always make sure that in any dealing with other people, they are always the ones who less, who need less. So think about it. What are your needs and how big are they? Do you need wealth? Do you need excitement? Do you need to travel? So if your need to travel and vacation in some remote area is so great that you'll have those two jabs and next year two more and the year after that two more until you become something transgender or a dog. See, that's how governments have power over you because the government is allowed to use violence against you they're allowed to cheat you, they're allowed to disown you, disappropriate you, they're allowed to deport you, they're allowed to imprison you, they're literally allowed to do everything to you that they want in order to benefit who exactly? What they call society are actually simply the families that are in power in this world. 
society is not the people. When they say the people, they mean the real people, not slaves, not citizens and serfs, not the plebs and the plebeians and the hoi polloi. They don't mean you. You're not people. You're voters, you're taxpayers, but you're not people. See, real people are only those people who are allowed to use all kinds of force, incarceration, manipulation, deception, and get away with it. And this happens to be a very small number of people. Just a few families usually in a nation, and globally, no more than a few hundred families who have this true power to inflict damage onto literally everyone else in the world. But here's my point. What on earth put them in that position to have that kind of power? Well, they have that power because they were always the sort of people who didn't need anything. And precisely because they don't need anything, they can maximize their wants and their desires and fight for those desires. And this is why they win. If you are a needy person, you will lose. You will lose to the person who is less needy than you. Yeah? Um, the more as a man, the more you desire to sleep with a very beautiful woman, the less likely she will be to give it to you, to give it up to you, because she has to give you access to her body. She won't do that if she knows that you really desperately want to need her. She may either find you uninteresting or weak and she will dismiss you outright, which a lot of men fear. They fear rejection like that because those men also need to be validated, approved. They want to feel that they're good enough for her. Whereas the woman is just playing with you. If you need to feel good enough for a woman and you want her body, that woman has power. She is pulling your strings, eh? string theory. Uh, it's not even her doing. She doesn't actually have that power. It's only the power that you've given to her by being too needy. Uh, a woman who knows that you desire her a lot, a lot more than she desires you, she will start to bargain with you if she thinks she can get something from you. She wants, she maximizes her wants and says, I want to have a lot of money. I want to have a good life, a good car, a big house. I want someone to work for me. I want a worker for me to earn me my mortgage and pay me a big house so I can party with my friends and sleep with other guys. So a lot of high grossing men are actually very needy men who need to prove their status, who need to prove their uh, ability to get a beautiful woman. And what happens then is they lose. They lose all their money to that woman. They give her all her money, they buy her a house, they buy her a car, and she barely or rarely ever sleeps with this guy because he's a slave. He's the needy one. She gives him what he really needs, meaning maybe once a month. She surrenders, right? Once a month. A lot of men are in a marriage or relationship like that. They're losers. They're constantly losing every day. They lose not because the other person has power, not because the other person is an actual oppressor using power to oppress you, but because you have made yourself subordinate by desiring, by needing too much. So, so it goes for life and, and conquest and to win power in the world politically or on, on the military stage. A person who doesn't need his life is far more able to risk his life to win something. He doesn't need life so he can maximize his wants and risk a little death. Whereas if you really need to cling on to your life, if everything is so precious and important to you, you want to look polished and perfect, you're not gonna want to lose that. You don't wanna have a scratch on your face, a scar on your head and look less attractive than you would like to be because you need to be you need to have face time with people. You want people to come up to you and talk to you and like you and interact with you. And if you need that social life from others, you have made yourself a needy dog, right? A dog is very needy. I mean, our human pets, the pets that humans keep, are very needy creatures. They need attention. They need attention because they need us to feed them. They need us to entertain them. They need us to go for a walk with them. They're very needy creatures who are essentially uh, genetically lower ranking beings than we are. 
I imagine it's so. If you own the dog, you're the dog owner, you control the dog's life, you can have it neutered, you can have it put to sleep whenever you want to. You have total power over this being. Is it really because you are powerful or is it because that dog is so submissive and so doggish, so weak? Well, there you have the answer. If that dog would one day wake up and remind itself that it is a descendant of wolves or of the common ancestors of wolves and dogs, that dog, the minute the door to your front door opens, would run out and start hunting in the park or start hunting in the forest and just survive on its own. But it can't. Why? Because it's needy. A dog needs attention. So it cannot live in the woods alone. Have you ever seen dogs who live in the woods alone? Like stray dogs? I've seen stray dogs in Albania. There's a lot of them there. People don't really like dogs and they breed like rabbits in the wild. So yeah, dogs survive in the wild because what do they do? They become beggars. The dogs who live on the streets of Albania are beggars who beg passers-by for food. <laughs> they cry. They're very submissive and they're also very afraid of people. That's because people who live there who don't like the stray dogs, they tend to kick rocks at the dog. So you kick a rock at the dog. So the dogs are very, very afraid of people. When you approach these, these stray dogs in Albania, they will, they, if, you approach you, if they approach you, they will walk in a big circle around you to avoid you because they don't know if you're gonna hate on them or if you're gonna throw them some food or something painful. This is not necessarily people's wrongdoing. It's not the people of Albania are doing anything wrong. It's those stray dogs who are still dogs. They have not been able to find their inner wolf and survive in the wild on their own because they're still needy creatures. Now imagine it this way, that you yourself are like that, like a needy dog and you need attention and you need job security and you need a place to live and you think that these needs can only be fulfilled through other people giving you these things. Why don't you crawl into the woods and build yourself a hut? Now you'd rather have the government provide you with a subsidized home. Okay, then you need to have some kind of good social standing. You need to have um, access to the right people who will give you this home. So you become, so you go to the, the office where you apply for a subsidized home, like the municipal office, and you're essentially a puppy. You're a puppy. You're weak. You're dependent. You're needy. You need the other person behind on the other side of the desk to sign something for you, to give you what you need because you're not able to get it yourself because you're not able to let go of your needs, to keep your needs small and then maximize your wants. I guarantee you, if you figure this out, to let go of your needs, to make your needs small and really truly not need so much. You need air to breathe obviously or you'll be dead very quickly. You need water or food and you need a place to sleep and it should be comfortable so you have a good rest, right? But those are your very basic needs and you, you leave it at that. You don't need a mansion. You don't need to play golf at the golf court. You don't need to have friends who are billionaires. If you would need these things, you become a slave at their mercy. Say, for example, you're a beautiful woman and based on your looks, you can become a model and you can make a lot of money being a model. Mm. But you're also in the market for a good husband, then I suppose. You want to have high quality kids. You want to have a billionaire husband. If that's you, if you're an attractive woman from a poor rural background and you feel that you really need to have a billionaire husband, of course, you're going to be a slave. Is it really because the men are oppressing you? because rich men with money make you dance for them? Is it really them doing that to you? No, it's not. It's you subordinating yourself because you're too needy, right? If you're a very attractive woman from a poor background, if you were not so needy, you would meet a man who wouldn't be so rich, but who would be, nuts, who would be a lot nicer to you, who would be very friendly to you, who would actually love you, but of course, a lot, of men, a lot of women do that, right? a lot of attractive women find a man who's just nice to know. But some women who are very attractive are also extremely needy for status and attention and, and the billionaire lifestyle. And they basically become a slave, like the sort of teenage girls who voluntarily 
flew to Epstein's Island because some of them went voluntarily. Don't forget that some of them were uh, ransomed by their mothers, but some went voluntarily, and those would be the needy ones. What I'm trying to explain with this string theory, where you set yourself up for other people to pull your strings, and that those other people are less needy than you, right? So the neediest people sink to the bottom of society, whereas the people with the least needs, they rise to the top precisely because they are able and willing to risk the most to get what they want. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any wants and desires. I'm saying you should maximize your wants and desires. Get everything you want from life, but not through being too needy. Make sure that these are not needy things. Make sure that the things you actually do in life are things you want to do, things you desire to do, but that these are not the sort of things that have you in the clutches, have you by the clutches, have you by your balls. It should be the other way around. It's very easy to manipulate needy people by uh, offering them the proverbial carrot on a stick and telling them, if you do this for me, and then you do that for me, and then you do that for me, I'll have you a little sniff of my carrot. You're a slave. You're a worker. If you ever feel oppressed by society, I can tell you, you were not being oppressed by society. You were doing it to yourself. You were too needy. So I'll try to give you an example. In, in medieval European societies, there was a knight class, a warrior class. Those would have been men riding on horseback. They would have been physically strong men. And they simply used violence and a preparedness to kill people to get what they wanted from the world. They would literally go around the farms and threaten the farmers to bash their skulls in or to rape their kids if they didn't surrender enough grain or whatever they needed. So this warrior class um, didn't start out with having the power to oppress people. It wasn't based on their class. It was literally based on their willingness to use violence and their preparedness to lose in a battle because they were less needy. They didn't cling to their precious life as much as farmers did. The farmers in feudal Europe were generally people, religious people, but they were also cowardly people. They were, there's a reason why they were peasants. They thought a peasant is someone who believes that by doing good work for God, you will be rewarded. But a warrior is someone who goes to these peasants and simply threatens to kill them and get from them what he wants based on his willingness to use violence and therefore his own willingness to hurt himself, to get hurt in a battle, to get hurt in a fight and to risk death. Because obviously most men who try to become warriors I'd say at least half of them died in battle and the other half were wounded severely at some point in their life and they accepted that and this is why the warrior class was established because there were men who were less clean who clinged less to life who didn't think that life was so important that you shouldn't risk it a little bit or a lot to win something and so you see a difference between a very small group of people who are willing to face death. This doesn't mean they want to die. They want to live, but they're willing to face death because they're less needy. They don't need life as much as someone else does. Whereas other people who want to live a long life, want to be 150 years old, and who never want to risk even, uh, even a small scar on the face, and they would try to avoid all violence, and they will try to avoid all conflict because they're so needy, to have health and life, they don't dare to risk it. Obviously, those people become the peasant class because they're needy. Looking around our society today, we have European nobility, we have the American corporate rich, like the Bush family, for example. And, and we have people even above them, like Henry Kissinger, who basically controlled George H.W. Bush at some point because it was. Kissinger, who spoke to Mao Zedong in China, whereas George H.W. Bush, if you read, he also wrote a book. If you read his book, George H.W. Bush was not a very intelligent man. He, had, he didn't have the intellectual capacity to be a world leader, but Kissinger did. So Kissinger uses George W. Bush as a pawn. Why? Because George W. Bush wants to be seen as the president. He, wants, he has the need to be 
in office. And so he's exploited by someone like Henry Kissinger, who doesn't need to be in office, but Henry Kissinger's desires were true power. And Kissinger, for a long time, the former Secretary of State of the USA, he was the kingpin of, the, of America, or essentially the emperor of the US empire. That's Henry Kissinger. I don't know who it is today, by the way. I wonder who it is today. But in those years where Kissinger was on top of his game, he was the empire, the emperor of the US empire. Because Kissinger is someone who desires a lot of power, but has absolutely no need to be seen as the president. And this is how it works. The most powerful people don't give a fuck about their Instagram. If you're someone on Instagram and you actually crave your likes and, and retweets every day, this is the reason why you're failing in life. And I think most of you know that I'm speaking the truth. In your personal life, haven't you met people who came up to you and asking you to borrow money or ask you for some kind of favor and you're like, fuck off, you know, like, People really annoy you when they're, they need something from you. Right, well, that's the same way it is when you're a man, you approach a beautiful woman and the first thing you want from her is her body. You're like a beggar and you automatically make yourself less attractive that way. The men women find most attractive are the least needy men. They don't need anybody. So they turn the role around, they turn the tables. And women also have certain needs. Um, a man may have a need for love and validation and appreciation and status that he gets through being with a beautiful woman. But what is actually the woman's need to be with a man? Well, money, resources, these are the classical things, but there's something else and it's excitement. So men have trouble dealing with rejection. Women have trouble dealing with boredom. I think men are a lot better at dealing with boredom because men can accept, okay, my life is shit. I'm not going to do anything exciting today. So I'm making a YouTube video. But for women, for women, it is very hard for them to deal with boredom. This is why in the past, when there was no internet, no excitement, no theme parks, nothing to do in the world. That's why women had a lot of children because children brought excitement into their life. Yeah, it's always excitement if a kid drowns, another kid gets hurt, another kid gets shot at. It's really exciting for a mother to deal with the emotional, um, the emotional consequences of having a lot of kids. If you have nine kids and shit happens to them, and this is very exciting for women. At least if there's nothing else to do. Nowadays, women just spend hours watching The Bold and the Beautiful reruns. Or, right there, they read, uh, they read books about exciting men. You know those novels you can get from the library, uh, women's novels, uh, roman romantic novels? They are about exciting men and what those exciting men do with the women. And the women, that's actually porn for women, right? So men watch porn, but women read those romantic novels about exciting men. That's porn for women, the real porn for women. So the whole uh, femme porn movement where they make porn for women that doesn't make any sense because actual porn for women is reading stories about exciting men and what they do with it. They read the books. That's romant romantic novels are porn for women. So if you want to be, if you desire, and you can have these wants and desires I told you, if you want to be with a very attractive woman, make sure that you actually are an exciting man and that's not not that hard to do it means you lower your needs. You're not as clean. You don't cling to life as much and you dare to risk more. You become automatically more exciting, especially if you go out into the world each day and do something exciting. Women, especially when women see you do exciting things, they will want to join you because like I told you, men may have trouble with rejection. Women have trouble with boredom. And if you can offer women excitement, that's when they flock to you. Thank you.